Got it. Got it, yes. Uh, just a reminder, I think most of us know it, but uh, for Taz, his first time here, we have a chat. If you look at the bottom of Diff Nebulum's chat screen at the bottom is where um, the listeners can put their comments. They're the ones that I'll talk through first after you've finished. And then after that, it'll be open for people to have a free um, conversation with you. But uh, yes, uh, Kevin has already sent out the uh, information that we were uh, about Taz, his background. Uh, as I warned during the, um, oh, not so warned, but commented during our dry run, we have a mixture of people here, old age, um, um, old age earth age people and the young age earth um, people. And we've been debating this on and off all through the year. Um, Taz, coming from Creation Ministries, you'd expect, uh, has his slant on that. So look, I'll hand over to Dr. Taz Walker and uh, let him introduce himself and then proceed with his slides. Over to you, please, Taz. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's a privilege to be with you. And uh, I take my hat off to the, the, the way in which you're, you know, uh, exploring things which are quite a, a little bit controversial, I suppose. And, uh, and uh, sometimes it can be a little bit un, uh, uncomfortable to thinking through some of these issues, but we're all learning. And mm -hmm. so that's really what we're about tonight. Uh, I trained as an engineer. I worked with the electricity industry for 25 years, something like that. I uh, went back and studied geology as a mature age student, where most of the um, other people that I was studying with were younger than my kids. And, uh, and that was a very, uh, very interesting time. And then when I finished that, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I ended up uh, working with Creation Ministries. So we're talking about tonight about um, uh, ge geology and uh, geological history, ge ge geological science and geological history. And so I'm going to go run through a little presentation. Uh, basically, I thought the simplest way would be in a way to tell my story as to how I got involved in this. And uh, as a Christian and as a geologist, as an engineer and a geologist, I thought I'd do that. So I might share the screen if that's OK and you'll be able to see what we're on about. Let's see if it comes up. It comes up. And um, so that's what we're talking about, earth science and geological evolution. And uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be able to share with you about it. So as I said, I trained as, a, as an engineer and that's uh, during my training, that's uh, what I was like. I worked in New South Wales at one of the big power stations there, coal-fired power stations and uh, as a practical training there. Uh, I liked, as a like a lot of young people, like to know how things work. I guess we all try to to understand the world and understand what's going on and understand how things fit together, and that's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, I uh, grew up in a church, and uh, I was uh, I went along to a boys' club, and at this boys' club, one, uh, one particular Easter. There was a real move of, of God and a lot of young people gave their lives to Christ. And we started on a journey as uh, following Christ in, in our teens, our early to mid teens. And uh, so I, I, because of that, I was passionate about reading the Bible. And uh, as probably most of you are too. And I remember, you know, getting into reading the Genesis chapter one and about the days of creation. And I tried to figure out you know, uh, as I wanted to work out how it matched together, I tried to figure out how it fitted in with the, 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 what the scientists were saying about the, the uh, history of the world. So you've got what the Bible says about how God created, and it says he created six days, different things on different days. And then uh, looking at the geologic time scale, I was not a geologist at that time, but it was all very puzzling. And uh, I tried, uh, and I, I remember hearing, you know, we didn't talk about it much in church. This is not an issue that was talked about, particularly amongst young people. We talked about other issues. And uh, I remember thinking, okay, so how does this fit in with what the Bible says? I assumed that the Bible was correct. Uh, and I assumed that what it was plainly saying was, was, was accurate, but I couldn't figure out how all this, these fossils and the millions of years and all that fitted in with, with what it said. And I remember, I don't know, it wouldn't have been taught in church, but I remember hearing the idea that, um, 
you know that it, it's the solution to this is uh, is uh, that the days were actually long periods of time, and I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I thought that was a great idea, and I, I explored that. You know, like you do, you come across a new idea and you start to explore it in your mind about how it fits. And I sort of realized that, well, I can't see how it fits. I couldn't see a, a, a strict correlation between what's on that geologic time scale and what they read in Genesis. And I sort of, I, I wasn't greatly enthused by it, even though I was initially. Then I had the idea that, that when you look at Genesis, that there was actually a gap between Genesis 1 verse 1 and Genesis 1 verse 2. And I'm sure you would have heard that as well. But And again, I thought, oh, that's really cool. You know, that solves it. You can put all those millions of years in there. There was a, an earlier creation. And uh, that was uh, when uh, then you had the flood. It was Lucifer's flood, Lucifer's rebellion. The earth was destroyed. And then it goes on. The earth was without form and void. And then there's a new creation. And so I just accepted that for quite a while. But as I thought about it, and as I tried to understand more about it, I realized, well, there's no information in that gap between Genesis 1 verse 1 and Genesis 1 verse 2. <laughs> there's nothing, no detail. I would read read what some people have said. I mean, they talk about Isaiah and about, you know, other parts of some of, some of the prophets about um, the, the, the fall of Satan and that. But I found that to be not very satisfactory uh, eventually. But, you know, I had, didn't really even think about the implications of this for the gospel, which I'd responded to. Uh, when you look at, and I, I, the, the, I illustrate it with young people with this. This is one of the uh, fossils that's in the museum in Brisbane. And it was found at, in a place called Mataburra, out the outback, right out in the outback. And uh, and there's a sign there when you go in. It's a spectacular fossil. It says it's 100 million years old. It's roamed around in the country of, in inside, you know, outback Queensland. And I often talk to young people about this and ask them, you know, what do you notice? And they say, oh, it's on two legs. It's got a big jaw. It's two thumbs a lot, uh, up. And uh, they, they, they would point out things that they notice about it. And then I'd say, but there's one thing I notice <laughs> is that it's dead. This thing's dead. And so for 100 million years, death has been on the earth. And, and so that sort of uh, uh, suggested to me, you know, that doesn't look very good. And particularly, I've since discovered that um, there's uh, these things that they've discovered tumors in the, the vertebrae of these, these dinosaurs and cancer tumors the same as the tumors in modern humans. And so for me, that really was a big issue. And uh, but it's that's the issue of evolution is it's death and suffering going on for millions of years. And that leads to people's our existence, you know, human evolution. And so to my mind, that really didn't fit with what uh, my understanding of the gospel and what the Bible was saying. So I didn't like that idea at all because I remember reading in Romans 5 verse 12, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Now I know there's various discussions going on about death and what's it mean and that sort of thing, but it, it really didn't appeal to me. Uh, because the Bible, you know, when you read there in about Adam and Eve, you read how it, the death came as a consequence of uh, Adam taking the fruit is commanded not to take. So that's that's sort of the and, and so that's the implications that I hadn't really thought about as to about, um, you know, these these ideas that I'd entertained about that it was it had a bigger impact than just the age of the earth. So, uh, but there was, a, there was a couple of things that, that impacted me. Well, I was in my 20s before I really thought about, before I really uh, encountered these. There was a, one of the guys in our church who was uh, uh, an older fellow who um, I remember as we were going out of church, he talked to the pastor and he talked about a book that he'd read and about how excited he was about this book. And the book was called 
the Genesis flood. And he, he talked about this and about the various scientific things. And I overheard what he was saying to the pastor. So I went and got a copy of it. So I must have been in my 20s by this stage. I think I would have been married. And so I got a copy of this book by Whitcomb and Morrison. I'm, I think you would be familiar with it. I'm probably you have read it. Uh, and it's called The Biblical Record and Its Scientific Implications. So what, it, what I realized when I read this book is that I had been looking in the wrong place. I'd been looking in Genesis chapter 1 to try to fit that in with the geologic column. Whereas in actual fact, this book was saying that it's actually Genesis 6, 7, and 8, the story of the global flood that is connected with the geologic column. And it's so uh, that was an, uh, an eye opener thing for me. There was uh, looking in the wrong place. And so Noah's flood was the key that was there. Not only that, it also indicated by the title of that book that I was look, looking at it or treating it the wrong way from a science point of view. And it says the biblical record and its scientific implications. So that's the, the name of the book. And uh, it says the biblical record, so it starts with the Bible, and then it looks as the impact of that on the science. And so whereas, you know, I'd been starting with the science and trying to fit that into the Bible. So that was quite an eye opener for me to be able to understand that to be able to sort of see that perspective. And so it clarified the nature of science because geology is different from the sort of science. And you might have, I think maybe Mark Harwood or one of the other guys has shown you a picture like this about the, 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 uh, the, the way science works in that's based on observation and experiment and we make observations in the present. So this was very helpful for me to understand that. And that so because we observe, the observations are usually repeatable, not always, but usually they're repeatable and they're in the present so that we can observe them. But geology is different in that it's looking at things in the past. We can see the rocks, we can uh, do the drilling and we can take samples and we can make do analyses and we can do a lot of uh, observation in the present on geology but we can't go back in time to actually understand how it happened. And that's the pro That's one of the, the key features of geology. And some people call it historical science or forensic science. And this, this is a little cartoon, but I think it illustrates it nicely, is that you've got the fossil, which is the rock, the geology, which we're observing. It's in the present. And then this particular person, he's thinking to himself, this fossil shows that fish grew legs and evolved out onto the land 300 million years ago. And uh, so the first part, the fossil, is the evidence, whereas the story about the fish coming out onto the land is a, uh, is a story. It's a narrative. It's an invention comes out of his head. And uh, another illustration of that is the paleontologist with his dinosaur fossils. So this helped me because... It helped me to clarify how to sort things out. When I was, you know, reading science books and, stu and studying this thing, I'd ask myself, what did they actually see? And uh, particularly with my grandkids, uh, you know, when they're studying science and they face the same <laughs> issues, they, the, the question is, what did they actually see? You ask yourself, you don't have to make a big noise about it, but that's the key. What do they actually see? And so, Here's this paleontologist. I think it's a it's a cute little cartoon, but here's the here's a fossil, dinosaur bone, uh, but it doesn't have a label attached to it. That doesn't come out with the bone, and so this is the scientific evidence can be analysed and tested and measured and weighed and all sorts of things, and that's the evidence. This is an interpretation based on various evidence and various assumptions, but that's an interpretation. But where does that come from? It ultimately comes out of an ideas that are in our heads. And uh, so that's that's helped me to understand and this, this particular issue to do with geology. And uh, and so when you looked at the geological column, I can you can see that okay. You got the, the various um, fossils or the pictures of what the animal creatures were that we find their fossils 
You've got the ones at the bottom and the ones at the top. So this basically is the evidence. Generally, it's the evidence, and um, unless there's some sort of misreading, and it's not always easy to, to be absolutely sure about what you're observing in, in the field, but that's the evidence and uh, what fossils are found, what layers are found, and the, the, the different layers are given different names like Silurian and Permian and Cretaceous and that sort of thing. But this here is the belief system. It's the assumptions about the age. Now I know, and I'll talk about this later on, we, I know we, you know, there's very radioactive dating and various methods used to try to find it. But when we're talking about a belief system, you know, I find it helpful to under, to think about worldview, to think about the way we look at the evidence. And so that's what I'm just presenting tonight, really, is I suppose the way that I look at it. And so if you're looking through the eyes or, or the assumption or the worldview of evolution over millions of years, which is basically materialism or naturalism, you know, that's the sort of picture you look at, but you can look at it through another lens, which is a lens of biblical history, and you look at it in a different way. So I, I just so I want to just first of all talk about the lens of biblical history. And uh, I'm going to use a a, a, a guy who's um, his name's Jack Ribcheck. He wrote a biography of a guy called James Hutton. There's a picture of James Hutton on the cover there. And James Hutton is the guy that um, that introduced the, the idea of long periods of time. And he his basic, his philosophy is sort of widely followed within you know, geological circles today. But this is a quite a very interesting biography talking about James Hutton. And he talks about the history of Scotland and some of the culture at the time. But uh, one of the things that Jack Rechek talks about at the time when James Hutton was alive, he was a physician, he talks about the fact that at that time, people believed that the world was not yet 6,000 years old. He said, it doesn't matter whether it was the Presbyterian Church or the Anglican Church or the Lutheran Church or the Catholic Church. They all believed that was a generally accepted position. Their clergy, their followers, that the world was not even 6,000 years old. And the reason why they believed that is it was based on a... a uh, a careful analysis of the Bible, and you'd be aware of that. And uh, it's, and um, it was not just the devout, this Jack Ripcheck says, who, who embraced this age. It was not just the devout, but it was the academics. It was the people involved, you know, in um, research and, and, and the, generally within the culture. And so, um, which is very, very interesting. And so you can sort of get a picture of what it was like. Like if you've, you've, I'm sure that you would have seen Bibles like this, where it actually has a date in the margin, which is based on Archbishop Usher. So they used to publish them. And for Genesis, it says before Christ, 4004, based on James Usher. So that's in the Bible. You don't find that these days. But then you, if you Encyclopedia Britannica, it talks about in 1771 edition. I think this is one of the first editions. It treats Noah's flood as a historical event, and it's actually got a, a, a artist's impression uh, of what it, the the ark would have looked like based on you know the, what it's described in the Bible. So that's in the Encyclopedia Britannica, and then it's got another articles in there talking about the ta a table of remarkable eras and events, and uh, in the Encyclopedia Britannica 1771, it talks about the creation of the world some four thousand years before Christ and the deluge of Noah's flood some 2,300 years before the flood, before the uh, before Christ. And uh, and also the, the early scientists, this guy, Nicholas Stino, he's one of the, uh, he's, he, he did sort of one of the pioneers of uh, geology. And uh, he wrote a book called The, the Prodromus. So it was called The Prodromus, which means an introduction and it's, it's to do with the, uh, understanding a solid body within a solid body. And, uh, but he's credited uh, in geological courses today. Ge geologists recognize him as uh, uh, 
establishing that fossils are the remains of creatures which were once alive, they lived on the earth. He developed the principles of stratigraphy, not all of them, but quite a number of them. Principles of uh, horizontality and, uh, you know, the um, different layers at different times and that sort of thing. And he also, in this particular little booklet that he produced, he, he developed a geological history of Tuscany. And it's the first, you know, it's heralded as the first example of geological history. And it's very interesting is that when I went through that and uh, I've written a little article about it, I, I discovered that he based that history on, uh, on, on biblical history, uh, uh, which is very fascinating. So that's established, look, talk, talking about, you know, looking at the world through biblical glasses. And that's the way it was very common back at this time. Uh, but then there came, there came along... Um, uh, let's have a look at the idea of evolution and long ages came from the uh, from the work of James Hutton. He was a physician, but he loved geology. And in this book by uh, by um, Jack Redcheck, he talks about the, the he, Hutton dealt with the problem of geology is how do you know what happened in the past? We can look at the rocks in the present, but how do you know what happened in the past? And uh, he came up with this principle uh, where he says the past history of our globe must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. So that's in uh, his uh, theory of the earth. And it's quoted by A.A. A. Holmes in his principles of physical geology. So it's quite uh, well known about this. Excuse me, Tasman, I just broke in now. We've got some grey panels that seem to be overlaying... Uh, some of your text is that something that's on your slide presentation it could be let me see are, that, are these the gray panels are they that's moved? The, ones, yeah, the ones yeah the one on the top and then one on the right there you go that's it done okay so i so that will happen a little bit but that's okay i can see that thank you okay so so Jack Redcheck talks about happens, uh, you know, he, he talks about the man who found time. And that's based on this principle that the past history of our globe must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. And of course, that means immediately we don't see global floods happening now. We don't see creation occurring in six days these day, uh, today. So we have to use slow and gradual processes. And, and as... Um, that book by Ritchick says that Hutton, Hutton uh, he basically assumed that the earth was likely millions of years old. So he, the millions of years came out of that assumption rather than the biblically determined 6,000. So that's where the long ages came from well before anybody knew about radioactivity. And it goes on, Ritchick sort of makes an interesting analysis of it. He says that Hutton's theory was deeply upsetting to the culture at that time on two counts. It says, first, because it questioned the veracity of the Bible, and uh, that's the first one. And second, it displaced humans from the start uh, to close to the start of time. And so that was the, the idea of, of, Jack, uh, of um, Hutton came into there. So that was about the late 1700s, 1795, I think, was when Hutton published, finally published it in writing, but he gave some lectures before that uh, to, the, to the various scientific authorities or the, but anyway, scientific groups. So Charles Lyell picked up on Hutton. He wrote a, a very influential book called Principles of Geology. And uh, 1830, the first one was published. And it was in three three volumes, and uh, so he 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 sort of explained Hutton a lot, and he praised him up, and he he advocated Hutton's idea of the present processes uh, being extended into the past. We we understand the past by looking at the present, and so his principles of geology. I think it's fascinating. I fa I thought that was fascinating that his subtitle here, Principles of Geology. He says, an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. So that's, that's. I think it's interesting that he talks about an attempt to explain. 
So because he's setting out, making this assumption that uh, the, 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 what's happening now, the causes now in operation have always existed uh, uh, that way, have they always been like that? And so he's going to explore that as being able to uh, understand the earth and understand the geology. So I, I want to just, um, okay, so that's, that's basically understanding the, where the geology comes from. The two different ways of looking at it is because we can't go back in the past. Now, what I want to do like now, and I hope that's okay, is I want to go back and look at it from a biblical perspective again. And so where do you start with the Bible? The thing is you need to know what happened in the past. That's what geologists need. And so they've assumed that things happened the way they're happening today, or we can assume that they happened according to what is explained in a history, which is Bible, which is the biblical history. And so that's what the where I was. I just assumed that the Bible was accurate. And when I read that book, I thought it was very exciting. And I lived as an engineer. And so I wrote it. I actually developed a little biblical model uh, just sketching for my own interest, and, and it seemed to work well. And uh, I remember talking to a fellow at work my, where I worked as an engineer, and I showed him he's not a Christian, and uh, I had written this little little thing about a little paper, and he read it, and he came back, and he said, "Yeah, it's very good. Um, it, it's very, it's quite interesting." He said, "But you know, nobody will take any notice of you." I said, "Why is that?" It's because you haven't got a, any geological degrees. You, you, you go back and get a geology degree. So that's what prompted me to do it. But this is how the model works. Starts with biblical history. So I hope you can see that enough. But it, go, it starts out, uh, okay, it starts out uh, with a timeline of Bible history. So you just, that's the way Usher worked. It's a pretty straightforward reading. It's not complicated. And uh, it starts with creation about 4000 BC which is what was in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Then you've got the flood. Similarly, what was in the Encyclopedia Britannica, but that's basically where Usher put it. You've got Christ and you've got the present. So that's the timeline of history. And so like so many things in science and physics and when we're analyzing and looking at things, you have to sort of imagine, you have to do a bit of sort of um, consider the situation. And so as a consider the situation where what would be, of all the events described in the Bible, what would be the ones which would have, uh, be, you know, be significant to the geology? And I sort of thought, well, the big one would be creation because that was God created in six days, it says in Genesis 1. So if you take accept that, so that would be a big one, the whole of the earth. And the other one would be the flood where the whole world was deluged and destroyed. So what I did was I just replaced that line with this line here. So that's the timeline. And the significant geological events are, are shown there. And then in between them, you've got various long periods of time. And so I just turned this timeline on its end. And so that's the biblical timeline. Creation down the bottom, the pre-flood era. And then you've got the flood, the flood event, and you've got the post-flood era. So the flood was about... 4,500 years ago. But it's a little bit uh, confusing or it's a, it puts us off a little because the, the amount of rocks we'd expect to find are different because uh, the would expect, like I put a little rock scale here. So I, I hope that's okay. So basically the creation event, short time, the whole of the earth, lots of rocks. The pre-flood era, a lot of time, 1,700 years, not much rocks you wouldn't expect. The flood, about a year, and yet you'd expect a lot of rocks, the whole earth deluged and destroyed. And the post-flood era, and you wouldn't expect a lot there. So you've got this uneven relationship between time and, and volume of rocks, time and quantity of rocks. So this is just my thinking as I was, I was actually in Adelaide when I first came up with this idea. I was at a, um, I was at a uh, electricity industry conference there, staying uh, in the center of the city somewhere. And so that was my first idea. And then I thought, okay, let's, let's add another column here. Uh, so we've got, if you take the flood, for example, 
you, you know, you imagine, you envisage that the waters were going up <coughs> and inundating the earth, and then the waters would come down and they would recede off the earth. And so you could envisage period when there would be deposition and then there would be a period of erosion uh, on the continents. And so the, and then I added another scale and uh, it's just interesting. And I hope you can read it. Maybe it's hidden a little bit, but you've got, say, just taking the, the recessive stage of the flood, you've got a period at the beginning of that where the whole earth was covered in water. So, and so it started to move off, but it was covering the earth totally and it moved in big sheets. And then eventually some land came above the earth, above the water, and then it flowed in big wide channels. And then you've got the, the, the so that's the idea of the, uh, a, a model for understanding the earth according to using the Bible and its history as our starting point. So then, and the, uh, you can go through and as you think about what could have happened, and I mean, it's speculation. So like so much in science, that's the way things work. You have to speculate and then you go and test. So I, I worked out for each of those uh, periods on the uh, time scale, what would have happened, what happened and what you'd expect to find and take this, for example, the waters rising and reaching their peak. So it comes to a period where the water entirely covered the earth. It's what it says in Genesis chapter seven, I think it is, uh, the, every every high mountain under the entire heavens was covered and all the creatures it says all the animals that uh, had the breath of life in them uh, that were, were not on the ark they died and they they, they perished uh, except those that were on the uh, on the ark and so you can that's what happened and then you can say well you'd expect to find the rocks would be wide scale covering huge area you'd expect to find some disturbance but not a lot You'd expect to find signs of dead animals, death. You'd expect to find signs of life, which would be maybe footprints. And then yeah, there's plateaus and mesa and erosion during the waters flowing off. So that's that's just a basic idea of you know the model, how it works. And I'm going through this fairly broad brush. So the question is, we haven't looked at any rocks yet. Does it work? And so these are some of the lovely sandstone uh, outcrops, the headlands at a, a Caloundra, and uh, which is um, Pearl and Beach is a bit above this, but uh, with some one of our one with somebody staying. But when you look at these sandstone rocks, and you they actually extend a large area. This sandstone covers a large area of eastern Australia, and you can see. Uh, the, the waters of the Great Artesian Basin sit within it. And not only that, when you could do a cross section across these sandstone, sandstone deposits, you can see that this is a, a, an exaggerated vertical scale 100 times. You can see that it's uh, uh, one or two, two, one and a half to two kilometers <laughs> thick. You can see that it extends right across 1,000 kilometers or more. And you can see that the layers, the strata, it can be traced across. You can see that they're shaved off at the top. You can see, can you see that? And the where it's quite a, an amazing deposit in Australia. But it's I mean these sorts of things happen around Grand Canyon and other places. And not only that, if you sort of go out into the outback of Australia, you find this dinosaur or remains of dinosaurs. So you find dead things, and also, amazingly, not far from where this thing was discovered, people were in a quarry and they were excavating the sandstone and they discovered dinosaur footprints. And uh, the government has, uh, has covered them up with this tourist facility to preserve them so they wouldn't get destroyed. And you can go in if you're visiting there and you can stand on this platform and look at the dinosaur footprints, small ones, medium ones and large ones. So that's... And so with that, then we can now have a look and we can say, OK, where do these sediments fit within biblical history? And uh, and so you can say, well, first of all, they're large scale. So they could be creation rocks or they could be flood rocks. You'd expect large scale things at that period. Also, they contain fossils, so they wouldn't be creation rocks because there was no death 
at the creation at the when they were laid down. But so they must be flood rocks. But they also contained footprints. So it must have been as the waters of Noah's flood had peaked and everything had died, it could not be the recessive stage of the flood. You wouldn't expect it to be that. It must be the inundatory stage as the waters were rising. And so we can put an arrow on our, mm -hmm. on our little, little model and as to where these rocks fit. And you can do that. You can look at rocks anywhere in the earth and you can do the same sort of analysis uh, and be able to figure out where they are. And so, for example, if you, and so this geologic column, I hope you can see it there with not too many gray boxes over it, but where these dinosaurs were, were discovered. So first of all, we get rid of the, the um, what you might say, the worldview, the, the long age worldview that's there. And so we remove the dates and we just simply look at the evidence, the fossils and the strata. And we look at that the way they're arranged and we see that the dinosaurs and the, in this area here, so that's where the Great Artesian Basin was deposited. So the dinosaurs were, were, were died and the, the waters were still rising at this point. So that means, and this was surprising to me, it means that the waters of Noah's flood were rising all through this part here of the geologic column and they would have reached their peak somewhere at the top of the Cretaceous. And uh, then the water's receding, you've got water's falling, and then we have post-flood. So the water's falling is small compared to a rising, There's the, re the results of that. And the, post, the you know, rocks deposited post-flood uh, are even smaller compared to the other period. So that, to me, that helped me sort of be able to connect how it fitted with Bible history, which is what I'd been thinking about since my early teens. And so you look at, say, Grand Canyon, you can see these layers of rock, which are, again extend for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers there. And so, uh, and when you look at it, this is basically these uh, sediments were deposited as the waters of Noah's flood were rising. And then you notice they go above the horizon. So the sediments actually extended probably a couple of kilometers above the horizon and they've been eroded off and the geologists in the US call it the great denudation. And so then as the floodwaters peaked and the waters were covering the whole area, they eroded these sediments away and the, you, you end up with flat surfaces with the sheet flow. And then you end up with wide channels with the channel flow and then, then post-flood, you've got just a little bit right down the bottom with the Colorado River. So there, so we can look at the, the uh, Grand Canyon uh, at USA and we can say, okay, this period here is where the sediments were deposited. And this period here is where the plateaus were developed. And then this period here is where the canyon itself was carved. And so we've got here an a, a quite an interesting way of... Uh, interpreting you know the, uh, the the geological history based on a biblical uh, biblical uh, scenario biblical uh, worldview now a lot of people you know I work with creation ministries and a lot of people write in asking for help on things they might say look I live in such and such a place how do you explain that from a biblical perspective or I you know traveling through you know, Western Australia, and I want to know, understand it. So we've developed, used this model to look at different places, and we produced what we call the geologic transformation tool. Now, it's sort of practical, but it's not exactly precise. But basically, you can see here, that is simply the geologic column. And it's got most of the things which are mentioned there, you can see the uh, the uh, Phanerozoic, the Cenozoic, the Mesozoic, the Paleozoic, and the various different different systems and boxes which are set up that geologists use and classify rocks to. So if you if you're anywhere in the world and you're looking at something, it will it'll give you a, you know it'll classify. It. These are Cretaceous rocks or these are Jurassic rocks. Next to it, we've put a a column, a list of numbers which is the assigned 
you know, evolutionary ages against them, and you can, that just comes off the the um, the, the, the Commission of Strat uh, Stratigraphy, the International Commission of Stratigraphy. These are the dates which are assigned. They change a little bit from time to time, <laughs> but those are the dates. But next to that is okay. If somebody is visiting somewhere, they can then uh, they can look at it and they can figure out whether it was deposited as the waters were rising or as the waters are falling. You can see the green arrow as the waters rising, the blue is the waters are falling, and the yellow is post flood. And the arrows uh, overlap a bit. You can see the down the bottom of the green arrow, it's dotted because there's some, uh, argu not argument, there's some discussion amongst creation geologists about where the flood begins and uh, what are creation rocks. But, uh, and then at the top, there's a bit of overlap because the geologic column doesn't neatly fit with the geological uh, uh, criteria for to classifying within a, a flood a flood system biblical flood system okay so what i was i i hope that's been interesting what i'm planning to do now is talk very briefly about uh, just about radioactive dating if that's okay uh, and it's only going to be brief i understand someone else from cmi is going to talk about it but what i'm going to do is just just use an illustration just use a um what you might say, an analogy. It's absolute dating. So it could be radioactive dating. It could be, you know, um, uh, thermoluminescence, or it could be all sorts of things can be used to produce an absolute date. All you need is something that changes with time. Uh, and usually with radioactive dating, they, it's usually, we're, we're usually told that radioactivity is a highly precise uh, phenomenon that occurs and it's not doesn't change with um, pressure and temperature and physical things and so the precision and the accuracy of this method is usually highlighted so I just want to use an example of a, a swimming race and you can quit quiz me on this later if you want to but say 1500 meters freestyle and so we've got a highly precise measuring instrument it's a it's a quartz crystal uh, watch and it's precise to the millisecond and uh, so it's highly accurate and so we rock up to this race and here's this guy swimming and when he touches the end of the uh, end of the pool we look at our accurate watch and we read it and it says 7 41 and 53 seconds so i often talk to kids about this and i and i'll um talked about this and so i say so how long did it take for him to swim the 1500 meter race? And uh, they'll come up with, you know, 41 minutes and 53 seconds, or they come up with all sorts of answers and they get quite excited until somebody, eventually one of the kids will say, starting time? <laughs> what was a starting time? And that's exactly the point, is that you can't know what, how long he took, no matter how accurate our watch is, and because we, if we've just read it at the end of the race, we can't know if we didn't know what it read at the beginning of the race. And uh, and that's, but you could assume things. You could assume, for example, that he started at seven o'clock, or seven fifteen, or seven thirty. You know, you can you can make assumptions about what it was, and it could be logical assumptions. I mean, we've always started these races at seven fifteen, and. We've done it in, you know, ever since we've been established as a club. You can make logical sort of assumptions, but you can get any time you like, depending on the assumption you make. And so that's basically, and I haven't, not going into it in great detail, but that's basically the whole issue of absolute dating. And another example that is used is like an hourglass, and uh, that um, it's just like, uh, isotopes are just like uh, sand going through an hourglass, potassium's uh, decaying into argon, and uh, you just read the read what's in the in the in the potassium and argon. You read that, and you can work it out, no problem. Accepting that again, you don't know the starting amount, and you don't know, for example, if there's been any of that gained or lost, or any of this gained or lost. And you don't know if the rates change for some reason. And so it's based on all these assumptions. And how do you know if 
the answer is the right answer, is the answer that's uh, required. And so that's where all dating methods involve what they call an interpretation. And I remember one of the very guys who did a lot of work in it says, there's no such thing as a wrong date. There's only wrong interpretations. And so that's the sort of uh, thinking that's behind it. So how can we know what happened in the past? And again, of course, the way is eyewitnesses and written record. And that's our birth certificate. That's how we know our age based on eyewitnesses. My mother was there at the time. And uh, that's how we know a lot of historical events like the first settlers in Australia, 26th of January, 1788. That was based on people who were there, who put it in their diaries and their logs. And so that's how we know these things. And if they, you know, if the record was wrong, then the date is wrong, but that's how we come up with these things. And that's what's in the Bible. And uh, this is a little, just a, a busy diagram about, it's got cartoon pictures of a lot of heads. Uh, and that represents all the different people that go from Adam, who is at the top left-hand side of the diagram, Adam, and his son, Seth, and you follow it all through to all the people all the way to Christ. And so you've got in the middle of the top line is uh, Noah. You can calculate that quite easily. And then you've got Abraham. And these are historical figures. We know where they lived, what they did, who they married, who their children were. We know this. You've got David and there's two lines that come to Christ. And so that's, you know, how the, um, you know, how the, the, the Bible actually is consistently, logically consistent in being able to provide a date. And so that's the way I thought of it anyway. So I just want to, and so what we can do is, what are we up to, 40, 64, 65? So when we see this, uh, and we've gone through this biblical model, we see this, this uh, dinosaur in the museum, and it's got the information about it. It's, you know, it, it should say from a biblical perspective, wearing those glasses from that worldview, it would say buried in Noah's flood 4,500 years ago. Or if you went to just uh, near Coolum, we got somebody from Coolum connected in the Glasshouse Mountains, very beautiful. And, and again, with this, you'd say something like eroded as the waters of Noah's flood were receding some 4,500 years ago. So how are we going? So we, 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 I think we're all right for time. I just want to, I thought I'd cover a few other things because, uh, th and there's a lot we could cover. This is a big issue. It's a worldview, it covers everything. So I'm going to talk about geological facts supposedly proving millions of years. And I was asked about one of them. Stephen asked me, I think, about it, about, um, uh it's called um uh extinct new uh, radionuclides uh yeah, sorry if i made fun of gordon this was i sent him some of your slides towards the end of your presentation in a second so i did actually send that to him to address yeah so i haven't i'm not covering it here but i'll talk about it later if you like but okay. that's okay the point is when if we talk about this if i say well i'm using you know basing my uh, my geology i'm basing my understanding and my geological history on the bible people people say but that's ridiculous you know there's what about this what about that what about the other thing and there's hundreds and hundreds of these things which uh people put uh, will will put forward as to the reason why that's just a ridiculous thing to do and I just mentioned a few, but there's lots of others. And uh, but one would be the opal. People, you know, the idea is opals take millions of years to form. So you know that's ridiculous. That just that just that one thing proves that your whole approach is wrong. And uh, but you know, there's uh, there's a guy in uh, Lightning Ridge, the the opal fields of uh, in New South Wales, toward just south of Queensland border. And uh, Len Cram, he did experiments and showed how opals could be grown in these sediments within a short time, within one or two weeks. He puts a certain uh, sediment from the area, certain liquid, there's certain, certain things in the liquid. And within just a few days, 10 days, the opal coloring appears. It doesn't take millions of years. 
Another one would be, I don't know if you've heard of it, but the idea that diamonds take millions of years to form. You know, you've got the diamonds which are formed, you know, uh, something like 200 million, um, not 200, something pre-Cambrian, which would be five or 600 million years ago. And uh, so, that, or a billion years ago. But this diamond actually it, it came from a company in the United States which manufactures diamonds artificially. They've got these large press pressure vessels. <laughs> they put within them, they put a uh, carbon and they seal it all up and heat it up and the high pressure and high temperature. And after four days, out comes a diamond. So they're called gemises. And uh, so, so there's that. So I was going to go into another one. I, it's, it's hopefully not too complicated, but another one is the idea of granite. So if you go to Phillip Island, which is just along the coast from where you live, uh, just, just to the east of Melbourne, you live in Adelaide, down that way. And so Phillip Island has got this granite, which is, this is Kate Wallamai, which is a great big granite uh, pluton. And, uh, and the idea is the granites are quite a attractive uh, rock, which is used for all sorts of things. But mm -hmm. the idea is, if you, sometimes they have uh, tourist signs up. Uh, the idea is that granite is like a lava lamp. You know, the lava lamp is heated and you get these uh, these uh, blobs of lava which float upwards. And, and so the idea is that granite is like that. It's a, a molten blob of magma which accumulates under the crust of the earth and it moves upwards uh, slowly over millions of years. And so it takes millions of years to form granite. So that's, think of a lava lamp. And... Uh, and so this is, you know, Pluton could be 10 kilometers in, in, uh, in dimension and it, it, it moves upwards with the, with the buoyancy pushing its way through the solid crust. That was a common understanding, the common way that granites were, ex were explained. But there's been some work done by some granite people and they're published in uh, papers uh, by a guy called Clemens. And... Uh, they, they, they come to the, they sort of said, no, it's catastrophic. Granite forms catastrophically. And this is the Geological Society of London, I think it was. And uh, so the idea is you get movements in the Earth's crust, which break the crust open. And as a result of that, the magma flows up through this crust and it can flow up, uh, through, you know, in less than an hour and, and accumulate uh, in these plutons under the Earth. And so... And we could go into more in, into about uh, the details with the granite, about the grain size and uh, the cooling rate and all that sort of thing. But uh, I won't deal with that right now. And there are articles on creation.com about that. So that's just three. Uh, uh, the three uh, phenomenon that can be put forward to say that approach of starting with the Bible is clearly ridiculous because. and. Uh, they, they show that, well, it's not quite just like that. And, and another thing that comes up is there's, there, there, there is evidence for a young earth. There's actually evidence that the earth is not as old as, uh, uh, you know, as, as this uh, geological philosophy, geological, modern geological thinking is. One of them is uh, diamonds, supposedly a billion years old. And uh, so people went and tested these in a commercial uh, uh, carbon-14 testing laboratory, which is highly precise. And they detected there shouldn't be any carbon-14 in diamonds a billion years old. None. Not in there. even after 100,000 years, <coughs> it should be gone. But they found detectable carbon-14 in these diamonds, which is quite an anomaly, indicating that. It's not billions of years old. It's evidence against the billions of years. And uh, that's one. Another one would be Mary Schweitzer, the lady who uh, studies dinosaurs. And she came across a dinosaur bone, a leg a bone, which was broken and she could smell it. And so she looked at it under the microscope and discovered red blood cells. The first person ever to do that. And she's since uh, discovered soft tissue. And she said something like, well, I couldn't believe it. 
I said to the lab technician, these, these bones, after all, are 70 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? Uh, but so there's evidence that sort of contra contradicts or is anomalous to the long age scenario. And there's an article Don Batten wrote, 101 evidences for a young age of the earth and the universe. Now, the thing is, is that you can't prove the earth is young. You know, these you can put forward evidence which points in that direction, but then people will say, ah, oh, yes, but, and they will change the assumptions about the past to say, well, that's because, and so that's why all dates have to be interpreted. So that's just a little bit about evidence for young earth. This article has got 101 evidences in it. And another one is telltale flood features. I've given, I talked about the model and, uh, from that model, it sort of, it predicts or it envisages certain processes which are occurring on the earth. And I think not Ronella might have talked to you about that uh, as a geomorphologist. But uh, so it's one of the things you'd expect to find when the flood water is covering the whole of the earth, flat surfaces, flat plateaus, and you find them all over the world. They're, they're uh, you know, right, right across the world, you find, and all through Australia, you find different places where you've got these flat plateaus. And another thing, you find these valleys which are far bigger than the rivers that flow through them. Overfit valleys, they call them. And that's because as the flood waters were receding, there was a lot more volume going through them at that time than there is going through them now. Uh, so that's another. A flood feature. There's lots of them. Uh, another thing is um, you find, and we talked about this, you find uh, uh, sediments that go for thousands of kilometers. Now, uh, and whereas for, for lo just local processes, you would not expect that to be the case. So this is the case with the Great Artesian Basin, and I showed you where they extend for thousands of kilometers, and you can trace them across the basin. Another one is um, uh, uh, Derek Ager, who wrote about, uh, you know, he wrote about the nature of the stratigraphical record. There's a book, a very popular book, but it's an old book now in the 70s. But that was one of the examples that he gave. He calls it the persistence of faces, you know, the persistence of different types of rocks. And he, he listed dozens of them uh, that he came across, and he, which contradict what he'd been tr trained as a, in, in his uniformitarian uh, training. And the other thing is, another one is rivers that flow through mountains. So this is an example of the Fink River at Glen Helen Gorge. You might have been there, very, very, very lovely place. But uh, this flows straight across the gorge and uh, rather than around it, you'd expect it to flow around it. And so geologists have sort of come up with different scenarios for how it could possibly cut through these, these ranges. It's the West McDonald Ranges. And a Google uh, picture from Google shows Glen Helen Gorge is uh, at quite towards the right hand side of, uh, of this picture. And you can see that the Fink River flows through ridge after ridge after ridge after ridge after ridge after ridge, after ridge and it flows straight through them. And uh, some of geomorphologists, you know, sort of so talk, say about they, these rivers, they just don't seem to respect. Uh, you know the the, uh, the 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 ranges at all, and and so it's been a puzzle uh, for for a long time as to how this could happen. So we've talked about you know uh, geology, we've talked about geological history, and uh, we've come, we've presented you uh, how it could be presented for within a, a a biblical perspective based on biblical history, and I've presented you a little diagram which you can download from creation.com and see how it works. And on that, the where that's presented, it talks about some of the uh, things to be aware of. It's, it's not all just straight going, but you have to be like anything. You have to be aware that there are certain things that can throw you off, but it's a good first base, first thing. And then, so I'll just mention, you know, uh, there's... Um, one of my friends was doing a talk like this to uh, one of his home group, I think, and uh, and a couple of the people said, I've never heard this before, uh, unlike you, which you have heard it before. And they said, 
I never knew that there was an alternative. I, I'm going to have to do some investigation. And so you can find good stuff on creation.com. And I'm, uh, you've probably already been there, but this deals with a lot of stuff on geology. There's geological histories in different places and, and evidences of Noah's flood and uh, post-flood uh, things that happened. So this, this is uh, geocreation.com. And uh, connected with that is a email uh, system. Uh, it's a, a free email newsletter. Some of you may already get this, but it gives a little digest of different articles that have been uh, published. And you can each week, you can just sort of flick through it and decide if you want to read it. So you just go to connect.creation.com. And uh, the other thing which I'm very, uh, that's been great help to me uh, and uh, I've been getting it for years, is Creation Magazine. And uh, you can get, it's, it's uh, it, the fact that people are scientists, that do research, they do investigation, doesn't make, that makes them experts in a particular area. But outside of that area, often we are, all of us, you know, a, a little bit like lay people. So creation.com, it's at the, um, the magazine, can be very helpful it's, and so it's written in, in for a fairly you know simple language but we've had lots of people have been uh, you know had you know found lots of great stuff in there and uh so another a couple of books biblical geology 101 it talks a little bit about what i touched on but in more detail and the guy michael Ord is somebody who picked up on this model which uh uh, I, I produced. I actually, I, I uh, before I was trained as a geologist. Before I finished my training, I went to a conference on creationism in Pittsburgh, in USA, and presented the model. And Mike Ord was there. He's uh, he, he's he's passionate about geology, and uh, he recognised that something like that was needed, and so he has adopted it. You know, he uses it a lot. And so you find some of the work that he does in that book. And uh, the thing is, is if you, you can get it through the web and there's a coupon code, today's day, TW, 22nd of the 10th, 06, not 22nd, 22, 2022, 10, 6 day, that's the day. So if you use that code, you can get a 20% discount. So that's, that's something to remember. And I think, um, your people would know that. And there's, there's another one called uh, How how Noah's Flood Shaped Our Earth. I talked about a few features of Noah's Flood, which are characteristic, and this talks about a lot more. Very fascinating. And then uh, there's a bit about geology in this book, Evolution's Achilles Heels, about three or four chapters on geology and one on, on uh, radioactive dating in that book. So that's a little bit more technical, a little bit more academic, but that's pretty good. So I hope that's okay. I've stopped my share and I'll be able to see you. I hope everything's good. And uh, so we can now have a conversation. How long did I go for? Not too long, hopefully. Um, it was about right. Thanks, Taz. You, you did the right timing. Yep, we started a bit late, just after eight. So that's about right. Okay. Um, I do know as I was looking at the comments coming in, we have the old ages are going to ask you a few questions here. So uh, I think I'll start at the top and uh, we'll go through them one after the other. Okay, so going right at the top, uh, scrolling right to the top. Okay, um, yeah, okay, would you like to answer that, Kevin? I think you're the top one there. Human death came through Adam Sin. Is that yours? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, you mentioned um, by one man came death, and um, you applied it to animal death plus human death. Um, uh, but I think the, the scriptures actually apply it to human death, not, and it doesn't really mention animal death. But, like, um, I understand the argument you're making that, um, um, why did you have animal death prior to uh, Adam's sin? But um, aren't similar tensions present already in the problem of evil? The problem of evil is a, a tricky thing to handle. And uh, isn't this in the same league? It is in the same league, I think. But 
if you're just like it, it, um, just taking it, it starts out with creation in the first uh, first chapter and the second chapter, and it, it emphasizes that everything was good. God looked at what He made, and it was good. And uh, it talks about uh, at the end of the six days, it be it looked at everything, and it behold, it was very good. So it talks about a goodness that was there, and so there would have been no animal death, and it actually. It gives a clue to that in that God says, I've given, you know, to all the beasts of the, air, the beasts of the earth and the birds of the air, I've given them every green plant for her, for food. So there's a hint there that um, that uh, we were a vegetarian. That, and so that's what I, you know, the way I saw that. And that at the, when the fall came, God put a curse on the earth. And it was, um, and, and so, so to me, that sort of goes, good earth, spoiled by sin so there's nothing before that you know when you when you sort of when we talk about uh millions of years you've got not you've got uh human remains fossils that go back you know mungo man 60,000 90,000 years and you've got uh neanderthals and that which go go back you know 400,000 but and then you've got other you got animals as well but there's an indication that it was a good world uh, that was spoiled by sin, and the whole earth is groaning and travailing. So that's that's the way I look at it. I don't know how other people who uh, could defend that animals being killed is a good thing, but the uh, the world, the, the suffering and pain is a consequence of sin, and so we live in a broken world. And uh, you know, and, and even when we become Christians, it doesn't stop being broken. But uh, it's going to be fixed one way. One day, the, the Bible talks there'll be, you know, in gen in uh, Revelation, it talks about there'll be no more death, there'll be no more crying. You know, the form um, Psalms itself though makes reference to God providing a, um, a food, a prey for the lions. Yes. Um, so um, I think you're on real dicey ground saying that um, uh, that death animal death is um wouldn't be considered as good um and that all animals were vegetarians when you look at a before the fall when you look at the animals they're created with um intention god created every animal with intention uh and you have an animal like the lion um he's created with huge <laughs> teeth um and even sharks, uh, they've got so many massive teeth. They're not, they weren't vegetarian beforehand or, and then suddenly their teeth changed. Um, and even their body structure or the fact that they're like lions and cheetahs and those type of um, carnivores, they, their whole body is uh, created um, to pounce and kill and rip, rip animals apart. Um, you brought to disassociate for me personally, um, animal death with and human death are completely on uh, a completely different level. I'm an animal lover myself, um, but I can't. The human death is on a different league uh, to animal death. So I'm I find and even scripture itself, like the one that Kevin mentioned, it's talking about human death. It's not Christ didn't say came back to save animals from. From death, he came back to save man. So that's scripture itself. Yeah, isn't the Bible a, a spiritual book about spiritual things? And we're talking here about spiritual death. Physical death has been around on this planet for at least the last 600 million years. There's a whole science of uh, what do they call it, uh, paleopathology. You know, looking at tooth marks in fossils and and uh, you know, all and um, uh, diseases and in dinosaur bones and all kinds of stuff like that. There's been death. In fact, the whole geological column, the whole of the of the uh, the fossil record, is a record of death. Long, long, long before any humans were on the scene. So to to say that. Uh, literal physical death only arrived with humans is just absurd yeah well of course uh, uh, yeah well uh, I suppose if, if I'm going to def not defend but if I want to put a perspective 
because Jesus died a physical death, if it was a spiritual, if he, if it was a spiritual death that came as a result of Adam's sin, then why did Jesus have to die a physical death? And then we've seen Rome in First Corinthians chapter fifteen. It talks about you know about the uh, the la the I think it's in there. It talks about the last enemy is death, and then it talks about it talks about that, and it talks in in Revelation about uh, the, the, you know I, I think I mentioned that about uh, no more death, but I mean again what we're talking about is two different worldviews. I put those two glasses up. Right, you look at it through this lens, or you look at it through that lens. So, if you look at it through the lens of evolution, yeah, death and suffering's been around for six hundred million years or more, going into the Ediacaran. So, definitely, it's been around all that time. That's looking at it through that lens, and that's why the glasses that we had had the, 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 the uh, it had the fossils of the dinosaur, and the evolution glasses had uh, bloodshed. When you're looking through them, because that's what you see. You see death and suffering. It's, it's not necessarily an evolutionary uh, set of a set of glasses you're looking through. I mean, it's just science, full stop. Multiple, multiple, multiple different branches of science all come to the same view. You don't even have to go to a uh, the, the, the detail of all the paleontological horizons. Uh, there, there are just so many different ways of showing that that time frame is correct. We even without, with or without uh, um, paleontology. Um, and if I can go back to your point about um, why would phys why would Jesus have to die a physical death? Well, um, when Adam and Eve were excluded from the um, garden, um, an angel was put there to guard the tree of life because if they ate from the tree of life. They were going to live forever. So physical death has a purpose in the sense that we, we can't live forever. Um, you know, evil in an evil person who's committing evil um, could live yeah. forever. That would be a horrible thing. So death, in a way, helps humanity to keep contain evil. That's what I would say, because and and that's what Jesus did. And as you look through the Bible, huge chunks of the Bible are spiritual truths pre-enacted in yeah. a physical sense you know the whole history of israel the uh, the ark of the covenant the the, the miracles of so, uh, the, there are so, so basically there, which which so is you, which is uh, a spiritual in intent but it's actually acted out in history so what you're you're basically saying as i sort of concluded at the end i explained how i looked at the how i looked at it i took it to be true took it to be factual and you're saying now that's just, that's not the right way to look at it. You so can't. That's fair enough. It's an you, interpretation. You can't, you can't look. No, wait a minute. You I can't. You, no, you can't just look at the Bible and say, "Oh, it's either all factual, or it's all not factual." The Bible is a complicated book. It yeah. has many aspects to it. There's just one part in particular, the Genesis one to eleven. That is one part which is not literal. Much of it, in fact, most of it, is literal. But you know, so, it's not it's not concrete one or the other. Of course not. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, so without diverting too much, now that Gordon's speaking to Gordon, I might let you go on with you after Kevin in there. So, did you wish to continue on with your comments there? I think there were three of them. Uh, Basically, you said Adam uh, is not a, is a generic name for all mankind. I think it's the first one. So I don't think anyone would dispute. I think yeah. it's fair enough. It's the next one, of course, that... Uh, in the name of a human, like in the Bible, it talks about a human. Adam yeah. is the name of the human. God gave his name Adam. And, uh, it, it also, but, and also it talks about Adam lay with his wife Eve and they conceived a son. So that uh, I, I just took that as being a, a human beings, the first man, Adam. Yeah. You know, I think the longevities of the uh, first, I don't know, 20 or so generations are a way of showing that uh, th this is metaphor and then there's that transition as the, the age has come down to something sensible there's that transition oh. to the historical part from uh, abraham onwards uh, so but, I just, uh, can i just i just can i just answer that in in a little way like i i stayed with a guy in victoria and he showed me around some of the geology of victoria he's a christian guy and uh 
he basically said the world can't be you know just the age of the bible because of this and because of that and because of that he showed me all the problems and that and i said so, and uh that made me realize that hey it's actually he's asking the wrong question it's not a matter of this bible can't it, it can't take the bible as it reads because of this uh, piece of evidence or that piece of evidence the, the the right question is how do we explain this piece of evidence within that worldview no and that right, is no 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 the right question is what is the spiritual intent of that bit of the bible not not the not the, the physical literality of it that, that's an irrelevance in many ways so how would you know that you, 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 anyway okay somebody else had you had another question did you I've, I've got a question a that I was questions. raised I let someone earlier. Else talk. Sorry, um, I just I was just wondering, Taz, if you could um, answer the uh, example that Bronwyn gave about lions. In fact, I would be interested in what your view is on the whole cat family, the large cats, all the cats. Um, do you yeah. believe that they were designed not to be predators? Well, again, you asked the you asked the question as to okay how do we explain that well one of the things that one of the uh, interesting fact is that after the flood that god said to noah just as i gave plants for food at the time of creation you have, this is a summary of it just as i gave plants for food now i give meat for food so the requirement of you know eating plants changed at the time of the flood and that's when animals uh we're, we're okay to be to die to, to be killed for food and also animals died you know like uh abel offered a sacrifice which was the death of an animal and you, you could even say that that's a for you know a spiritual truth of that is that it foreshadows the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins so that's that's uh, uh there so what else, what else was it so the sharp teeth just because an animal's got sharp teeth doesn't mean to say that it, it always eats um it's it's uh, meat there's uh we, there's many examples that that uh, i've seen of uh animals like there's a bat which is eats fruit and it's got sharp teeth it's close it's an omnivore though it's an omnivore you, a bat is no, an omnivore it, so it, it eats fruit, fruit and insects okay well you're talking yeah. about a lion it doesn't eat grass unless it's for digestion so you separated oh, sorry, from all of that. Question, we do have some my question animals, was: uh, some Are they designed to be? Are they designed to be plant yeah. eaters? You haven't answered my question. Yeah. You just singled out. Are they plants. designed? Well, yeah. the, the question is: Okay, did God for for did He have a foreknowledge of the fall and design things to be able to cope in a fallen world? That's one possibility. Another possibility is that some of the things which are designed, like teeth. Were not like those sharp teeth were not used for um for, for, for eating meat. They were used for other purposes. So you know, there's various hypotheses, ideas that can come up, and that's an uh, that's what scientists do, isn't it? Is they come up with the hypotheses to explain things within a particular paradigm. But if I could just butt in there for a second, Taz, because that's really relevant. Oh, hi, my name's Tom. Thank you for your presentation, by the way. But um, okay, uh, um, you in the bone metaphor i have this question later in the chat but it seems to be really relevant now in the bone metaphor you were saying we shouldn't use a hypothesis or at least when we go to hypothesis we're using speculation so would it's you at just, least say would you at least say that young earth is speculative ah uh, of course it's based on assumptions it's based on assumptions. absolutely you're oh, sure okay. you know and, thank uh, you if, that's good and so would you assure you would you agree that an old earth is based on assumptions is speculative and the difference um, is that there is no evidence for a young earth there's an abundance of evidence for an old earth but, i mean just look, Gordon, at Gordon, just look at reality Gordon, Gordon hmm? just let's let's not get off the topic for a sec because i think this is i, I think taz just made a, a, a something that that was actually very consistent there he's he said look the bones were a um uh a, a, that's the, the evidence dating of the bones was regarded as uh, assumptions and and he's and and i think he's been uh correct in saying well 
you know, they're assumptions based in young earth creationists. So, so what we're what we're we're doing then from there is is weighing is weighing the hypotheses. So I I just wanted to establish that. That's all. Thank you. But I also yeah, put up but they're to not you, assumptions. No, I put up to you. I, I put up uh, Hutton and Lyle. Hutton said the the problem with geology is we didn't see it happen. So the assumption is that what happened in the past is exactly the same as the processes we see in the present. The present is the key to the past. So that's the assumption. And the same with, uh, with uh, Charles Lyell. He said, this is an attempt to show that the past you know, history of our globe can be explained by what is, is happening now. So right. that's the assumption. And so that's but, the world view. And, and that's and the way I see it you, anyway. And the assumption is that the, the, the young earth assumption is that the um, Bible must be interpreted literally in terms of a young earth. So it's just which set of assumptions actually now need to be weighed. But but I'm, I'm glad that we're agreeing that we're both relying on a set of assumptions and, and interpretations, because what I've heard before yeah. um, is that, oh, no, the young earth creation is just relying on what's in the Bible and it's plainly obvious, but in fact, actually, old earth creation is relying on a whole lot of assumptions but i'm i'm just glad that, that we're that's saying that we're in the true. same that's boat not true i can't see how it's not true i don't see how it's not true yeah, you got oh gordon not i'm not saying that the assumptions are equal oh no 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 that's not what my claim is my is, claim is, okay, is is that Tom that's speaking yeah 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 it, gordon it's just simply to say that we both the the, the claim has been made and uh, by a number of folks on on the the young earth side right that the scientists are basing uh theirs on a whole lot of assumptions and interpretations which i just and believe. and we both are now now we can weigh the assumptions and interpretations that's a different story well we can weigh the interpretations and, and the validations and the the cross-checking of multiple multiple different methods yeah. Uh, this isn't. A, yeah, but we found a point of commonality. This, this is and just logical important. deduction. This is logical deduction, not assumptions. Yeah. Um, Look, can I, say I, I think we might. Yes. Oh, sorry, Kevin. Did you want to take over here? Yeah. Well, I, 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 everybody makes assumptions, and I don't think there's wrong with it. The uh, question is whether they're reasonable or not. <laughs> um, so, so uh, all right, science. You're making logical deductions, but based on what? There, there's still. Um, assumptions at the beginning but you know some assumptions are better than others so so i agree with tom <laughs> look i think okay. we've obviously oh, got I, think the word, I, I think the word you know saying science does this and science does that i think that is a how you, a self-serving in a way that's the way i see it is that science we are scientists we say that we don't make any assumptions and um uh, Whereas it's it's actual, I, I would call it, and I don't really have a good good word for it. I call it evolutionary science. Evolution means it's slow and gradual. It happened over millions of years, and it involves geology and 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 uh, evolution of um, uh, of animals, of the biodiversity. So I, that's one assumption. That's why I see it. So I, I yeah. So rather than saying science does this, I'd say evolution, evolutionary thinking. Or naturalism, or something like that, versus um, a, a biblical a, a biblical approach, based you know, which is a biblical approach based on just taking it as it reads. And you could then argue that you know the apostles did that. Uh, if you look in he, in Hebrews chapter eleven, the people that are mentioned are the people you know they're out of Genesis chapter uh, <coughs> Genesis in, in, in five, five, five and, because we have Abel being um, being killed, don't we? We have a Big Cain killing, right at the beginning. We have Cain killing Abel. That's a historic fact that is in Hebrews eleven. That's we'll in Hebrews eleven. So we start with with uh, yes, Cain and Abel as as one of the illustrations of faith. And I think Jesus referred to that too, didn't he? He says, uh, you know, I, I can't remember it offhand, but it's from the time of Abel until the present time yes. when something. Yes. So he, he referred to Abel and it, as a. So it gives, just gives the impression that he regarded it as history, mm. and uh, you know, and so and it's all the way through. You, I, I, they're not at my fingertips to pull them out, but it just seems that they took it that way. 
And it's, uh, yeah, and, and as I said, the early, in the 1600s, uh, 1700s, was it 1700s at the time of Hutton? You know, the culture at the time of Europe was everybody believed the world was young. And it was Hutton's assumption which changed all that. And that's the bait. It's been called uniformitarianism. So that's what changed the worldview of the, of the culture. Um, if you kind of say, all right, what do we assume first, the Bible or science? Uh, amongst the non-Christian world, if you kind of uh, had science versus the Bible, the Bible would lose. Um, so it's not going to um, have any uh, grab on a non-Christian. If, if you said uh, choose between the Bible and science, um, to the non-Christian, the, the Bible would lose. They'd just chuck the Bible out. Well, I, I think uh, my experience is that, like, I do use the Bible to begin with. I, I, I'll use science to begin with. Like, I talk about evidence that people and dinosaurs live together, and there's quite a lot of that. There's books with, of that. I, I talk about, you know, I talk about some of these things, and people are very interested in them, People, ordinary people. Um, I, I'll talk about the gospel. I'll, I'll talk about the fact that we live in a broken world. And uh, where you know, and and about the t things that are in the world, and everybody is experiencing a broken world in their lives. You know, whether it's sickness or people dying or broken marriages, stress. So people identify with living in a broken world, and then I'll say, but you know, that's not the way it was originally. In the beginning, God created a harmonious world, a beautiful world, and people re resonate to that because of the pain so it, it gives a you know it um so uh the applying what the 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 bit the, the the gospel a good world broken by sin and, and which jesus came the son of god came he took the penalty for our sin and we can be redeemed and we can be saved so that resonates with people and then, of course, the questions come up. Well, what about this? What about that? Like, I, I, there's a lady I know that in um, lives in Melbourne. She was a Buddhist, and uh, she used to argue with Christians, uh, and just thought Christianity and the, and everything in the Bible was just a lot of mythology. And what happened was, she somehow started reading the New Testament in order to be able to argue better with them. And as she was reading about the Gospels, she, she came to believe that this is true. This really happened. And she put trusted in Christ as a result of reading the New Testament. Mm -hmm. She was so excited, she would talk to everybody about it. And when she went to work, she started talking about, and some people at work says, oh, yeah, what about, you know, the, the age of the earth? Do you believe that God created in six days? You can't believe that nonsense, do you? You're an educated woman. And so basically, it just threw her for six. Those are the sort of things that happen. And uh, so what are you going to come along and say, well, you know, when, when it's a, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but I'm saying is you don't have a trouble talking to people. People have this as an issue and uh, in their, in their lives, uh, they need to come to know the Lord. And this is a stumbling block for many people. I have a burning question on that. And, um, and you, you, you equated materialism and, and naturalism you seem to uh, you seem to be equating an old earth position with an atheist position um, uh, with a couple of the comments you make. Now, maybe they were just offhand and I'm taking them the wrong way. Um, but that you actually re referred to, uh, you know, old earth as materialism and naturalism. Um, so two questions, if I could, Taz, and I'll let you, I really want your answer. One is, one is, do you is that the way you see it, or is that just a, a, a misinterpretation on my behalf? And, and secondly, um, if uh, if you were given incontrovertible proof that you couldn't walk away for an old Earth, would that would your faith go away, or how? This seems to be very intrinsic to your faith, and I and well to the young Earth creationists, and I know I know I want to be respectful to that, but. But do, as the age of the universe goes, does your faith go? No, we start with the Bible. I start with assuming what, what's written there in the Bible about creation in six days and a fall, literal fall, a world which is then under a curse. I, I assume that that's true about 6,000 years ago. So 
But if, so, that, what, if, if you've got some incontrovertible proof, um, and, and I'm, I'm posing a hypothetical, but I think it's an important one, an important one for our community. If if you had some, if you had a proof that you or evidence that you believed that showed that 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 it couldn't be a literal six days creation, would that wipe out your faith, or would that just get you to modify your faith? Well, that's the way it works within paradigms, isn't it? Did you see that thing that I put up with Mary Schweitzer? And about the blood vessels, you know, the blood and that sort of thing. She didn't say, you know, uh, this, you know, the world must be young after all. She didn't say that. She had this evidence. She says, I couldn't believe it. These things are 70 million years old. They can't be, they can't be 70 million years. She didn't say that. She said, how could blood survive that long? And so that's the way both worldviews, and I put the two up, that's the way both work. Any, any evidence which contradicts the worldview doesn't usually change a person's opinion. So they then start to say, well, how could we, you know, what are we going to do to be able to explain this? Let me and press you. Let me press you because I'm, I'm posing, I think, an important hypothetical. It and is. it comes down to priorities. Hypothetical, forget what is, just for the moment, if you were... And if you could, I, I think this is actually an important question for us all, old earth or young earth, because I see more in similarities. We've, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, right? That's true. But, but it seems like there's a pro I'm trying to understand. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, know, I, there's no gotcha here, right? I am really mm. trying to understand um, uh, if, 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 does, does your faith, go with the age of the earth like i mean if the age of the earth was was proven to be um you know from starlight from james whatever it is right from gravitation away whatever right or as a geologist if there was something that you couldn't deny as a geologist does your faith how badly does your faith get challenged see uh, um well Okay, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated answer, and so there's various nuances and that sort of thing. But basically, in a, in a nutshell, once you adopt a worldview, you know, once you adopt a worldview, the question is, uh, how do I explain that within this worldview? That's what happens as a Christian. You get questions that come up about all sorts of things, not just science, but about all sorts of things that come up. And so you try to work through and come up with an answer, which is satisfying. And, well, I spoke to a person uh, who was involved in a, a um, sort of a relative of mine, and uh, he was going to church as a young man. He's now in his 70s. And when I was talking to him, he said uh, he was going to an Anglican church. He said, as I uh, was going along, there were more and more and more things that I could tell myself, I just can't believe that anymore. So he's dropped out. And that, that happens. A lot of Christians drop out of things because they can no longer, they no, no longer believe it. And so, but the point is, the, the other point is, is that you say, if some incontrovertible proof could come forward, which would prove beyond a shadow of doubt that the world is millions of years old. What are you going to do? What evidence are you going to provide? What is it? No, no, be but, 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 well, well, but it's a hypothetical. Yeah, it's, it's hypothetical. Like for, for myself, really it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Sorry, Tom. It doesn't matter. I'll just use myself for an example. Um, I've he held a younger few for for probably thirty years of my life, and now um, I, I still hold a biblical worldview, but I hold a day age view. I find that's fine. I, I can see that the earth can be millions of years old and I can believe, take the Bible literally. Now, I differ from um, someone like Gordon, right, who doesn't take it from that point of view. But if, if, I, was pro, if I was proven wrong and it, the, worth, the earth was young, it really doesn't affect my faith. Okay, if the, if the, if it was proven that the, uh, that the, the scripture was um, parts of scripture was more um, uh, mystical uh, than, than I think at the moment, it doesn't really affect my faith. Okay, so Tom's asking, just hypothetically, um, if it was shown to you that, that a young earth view 
um, was was uh, impossible to hold anymore, would that affect your faith? Could you believe, because it really this is all superfluous to the gospel message as far as I'm concerned, Absolutely. and we could all be wrong. Mm. Okay. So I can uh, turn that around, and I, I don't want to be silly on this, but I could turn it around and say, if there was incontrovertible evidence that could be presented to you that the world was not millions of years old, but that it was young, would you would that affect your belief in an old earth? Not at all, because I hold it. I hold it possible. I actually hold it possible, but extremely unlikely that the world is young. But I notice. I think you're giving us an answer, Taz. And I, 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 I like I said, there's no gotcha here. Yeah, because uh, this could be quite healing for us, but I feel like you're being politician and you're not answering the question. Now, just say if you don't want to answer the okay. question, don't answer. I thought the I'd question. answer the question. Yeah, no, I thought I did you, answer it. I said no, I can't speak. You, I don't think you did. If I, if you did, I, I missed it. Could you try again, please? I basically these. I've said a number of times that basically it depends on how you interpret the evidence. And if so, there was evidence or arguments presented to me, which, you know, uh, sort of went against, contradicted a young earth position, I would think, okay, what's going on here? Let's dig in and think about how this could probably be interpreted another way. So that's the way it goes. You're saying it's young earth or that's it. So you can't actually interpret, take, it has to be young earth. Well, some of the things that are important to me uh, that hinge on a young earth. And one of those would be the fact that Jesus died for our sins. So that's, you know, and I mean, I hope I don't contradict yeah. or anybody yeah. here or upset anybody here. But the fact is that, you know, uh, it talks in Romans 8 about how the whole world is in bondage and just, uh, under, under this condemnation and that. Okay, uh, this has become theological. <laughs> I remember one of the guys saying these people want they want facts. They don't want to get into theology. But uh, so I'm, I'm not really br brushed up on it. But there's a lot of places in the in the New Testament where it talks about you know, you know the the um, uh, how Jesus you know how Jesus died to redeem the world. He's come to redeem the world, and how death is the last enemy. Death's not a good thing, and how at the end, we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. It, you know, is it going to take millions of years? Is that what does that mean? Is that spiritual for millions of years? It's a twinkling of an eye, and and he will lay the you know the uh, the, the kingdom at the Father's feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So I just think it, it doesn't uh, match me. But also the other thing is, if you've got death before Adam sinned, if you've got death and suffering and that before Adam and sinned. Who's, whose responsibility is it? God did it. And so there's a guy uh, in... Uh, is a, is a, a bigger pardon? Not necessarily God did it. I mean, God created a neutral platform, planet Earth, in which good and evil can happen. Yeah, which where good and evil was happening, mm. surely. Yeah. Animals were killing I, I, I one think, another. Uh, I think uh, Tom's earlier point was was a good one. That basically, uh, all this young Earth, old Earth, pales into insignificance. It's irrelevant compared to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's salvation. That's what's really important. Uh, and my worry is that some people might look at this on YouTube or whatever and think, well, if. Uh, it, if Christian, if this is what Christians believe, and you have to believe in a young earth, uh, despite all the evidence to the contrary, then I, I don't want anything to do with it. Now, I'm hoping no one will take that view, but that, that is the risk. That is the spiritual risk going on here. Yeah, well, of course. Um, okay, well, I, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, that's, I don't agree with that position. I think that... Um, Science is the you know if you know these various summaries that have been looked looked at is that science is the big sticking point for people in our culture today. Science is the sticking point, and why is that? Because what they hear in science indicates that you can't believe the Bible. You can't believe. I, it's so I disagree up. with that. I no, actually, no, 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 no. and so does Gordon. Like, and we even have we have different takes on that. 
And we both, yeah. I've got a friend who's a, who I would say perhaps one day might become a Christian. Um, he sort of dabbles in it, it very th uh, f philosophical. And um, we have long discussions. Um, he definitely could not um, attribute himself to a young earth view. And he certainly wouldn't um, say that um, the Bible can be taken literally. So when I talk to him, I talk to say, well, you can believe in an evolutionary point of view if you want. And you can, um, as long as you believe in Christ and what he did for us, that's the most important thing. So I don't hold on to these types of concepts as the be all or end all of my, um, my worldview um, as far as Christianity goes. I try to be loose about it when I'm talking to other people, although I'll say my personal take on it, but I'll say people can take three different interpretations from scripture um, and that's what's good about Christianity is that we're allowed to have different views. Absolutely, you know, you're, you're right, Bromley. Uh, Bromley. Yeah. And uh, the, one of the problems is that is this whole question is looked at as science or the biblical view, one or the that's other. Right, that's what I said. There's, it's not, yeah, the it's not what you that, said, yeah. but, it's, but it's not what you said, but it's what many people do say. Yeah, uh, and there's more than one way to read the Bible. Yeah. I I would yeah. take the view that the original Hebrew way is uh, mm. the best way for reading the Old Testament, at least, um, yeah. and that would certainly not be literal. And and you've got the literal uh, mm. view, which I regard as heretical. But um, you know, there's there's two very very different ways of reading at the text, but still the Holy Spirit can work through people who are yeah. imperfect and can come to and can give them the uh, spiritual insights that they need, no matter what biblical take they take, they, they, yeah. they adopt. And there's also, there's two different ways of interpreting historical science. So you said there's two different ways of interpreting the Bible. At least. And I, uh, and I, I don't think, I think, <laughs> But there are. I, I tried to explain that. I tried to explain it. I went through the model. I went through, I talked about Hutton and I talked about Lyell and the, and that there. And, you know, there's been a change. You know, Lyell said that that we can only use slow and gradual processes like what we're happening today. And uh, the, the thing is that Derek Ager and others have come to realise that when you look at the rocks, they show evidence of catastrophe. And so, in and in, uh, uh, I don't know why we're discussing Lyle. That's that's opinions which are two hundred years out of date. I mean, mm -hmm. it's long been known in geology that it is mainly uniformitarianism, but with a few catastrophes and a few other missing right. bits and pieces in between. It's complicated. That's Lyle. That's Lyle. Yeah, but uh, you know, we're, we moved on Lyle. from Lyle two centuries eh? ago. We moved on yeah. from Lyle two centuries ago. Where we got a same more with, um, view of geology now. It's the same with Newton. We've moved on from Newton, but we still use his his uh, the things that he put forward. And Lyle, his principles are being used. It's it's bread and butter for geologists to use uniformitarianism. Yeah, but it's no uniformitarianism accounts for most of what we see, but not all of what we see. Obviously, volcanism and tsunamis and all that sort of stuff. Uh, earthquakes that is obviously not uniformitarianism that's something different uh, and it's a ge modern geology is a blend of the two uh, uh, explained by plate tectonics largely uh, what did you think uh, of the what why, did why, of do the, we look, why do we use outdated uh, concepts it's not outdated it's taught it at, is at, outdated uh, Go, go to any geological department on the planet and ask, is the, is the 200 year old uni, strictly uniformitarian view still current? And they will say, no, it isn't. We've moved on from that. We've got a more holistic view from that now. They call it actualism. Well, they call it various, various names, yeah. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> so there you go. I think oh, I might pause now. Please, We've please, got about. Please, can, please, I, can I please, please butt in? Yes, as the compare here, I just want to note that we've got about you know, maybe 13 minutes or so to go. I really appreciate, if I may say, the tone of our discussion so far. I think it's been good. It's been quite polite. Uh, I appreciated Tom's um, probably hitting you right on the point. You know how important is the young old age to your faith? Now, is there any other 
I guess, comments that we should bring out in the 10 to 15 minutes that we would normally have left that we want to now put to a uh, test? Well, we spent a lot of time discussing theology and yeah. biblical interpretation, but I, you haven't, I, I presented a lot of geological evidence uh, in my talk. I talked about the Great Artesian Basin, I talked about the Fink River, and I talked about um, the water gap through the Fink River. I talked about the persistence of facies and a lot of things like that. You, and you, you've, you've not mentioned those at all. Oh, there's some comments uh, there. Uh, I would love to discuss I... all of those, but there just isn't time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Steve, um, can I, uh, uh, I put in a comment about the Artesian base, Basin. Um, you can also use the Artesian Basin to uh, demonstrate long ages because um, the waters actually uh, enters the cut, uh, artesian base it's mainly from the great dividing range in mm -hmm. um, and um, and yet it, you have springs uh, appearing in south australia the water actually uh, goes um, through the porous material through the artesian basin and you can apply uh, Darcy's law and you can calculate that it takes bet between around about 1.1 and 1.5 million years for it to go from the uh, Great Dividing Range to South Australia. Actually, it's about 1.3 million years. It's been verified by chlorine 36 as well. Two, the, the Darcy and Bue and the chlorine 36 gives pretty much identical results. And also, there's a whole heap of sedimentary evidence within the Great Artesian Basin, which proves that it was not deposited during a flood. Can, can I just say, how many people is test? Now explaining that. Beg your pardon? I can, can I say, sorry, you half an hour explaining precisely why that is the case. Well, there's, there are other views on that, and they're not creationist views, but there are the views in a sort of mainstream academia that the, the, the waters of the Artesian Basin are actually being mined that they're, they're, the amount of recharge from the um, Great Dividing Range is not sufficient and so the, uh, to, to, to maintain them. And so that's why there's been a huge program, problem of a program of capping all the artesian wells because it's been going down. So there's another view on it. And well, like, that, has we nothing to do with, that has nothing to do with the age. Of course it has. No, it doesn't. If, if, the, if the waters were were deposited with the sediments it's called conate waters if they're deposited with the sediments it, it, well, then it they'd be, if, they, if, they were, if they were deposited with the sediments firstly if they were marine sediments as as per the flood then there will be sea water and not fresh water and it is fresh water and you can see the hydrochemical evolution from the source rocks in the east to the mound springs in the west, and you, you've got very reliable isotopic means of measuring the time that it's taken for that water to transition that distance. Plus, there's a whole range of sedimentary facies within the Great Artesian Basin, which cannot possibly be consistent with flood deposition. Such uh, as? A whole range of coal measures, for example. There are uh, desert sediments with dry canters and tri canters. Uh, there's uh, there's um, desert cross bedding. Uh, there's a whole heap of stuff, uh, uh, together with the uh, microfaunal evidence of the zonation. Um, uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense to try and say this was all deposited in just uh, a few days. That's ridiculous, frankly. I do need to, is, I do need to give a the... fact here, um, and that is those springs come out in Yalata, the freshwater springs, a lot of them actually come out in Yalata, and I'm sorry, I can't help quipping. That's why we all go there to catch big, really big fish. <laughs> and that's the material point. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is that, Tom, you're, you're presenting the evidence, you're just looking at it in one way, and that's fair enough, but evidence is interpreted. And so when you talk about large dunes, large dunes can be created in, in large floods. And no, uh, so the they are the water... They're not hey? the same. There's geological evidence whereby you can distinguish between the two. Well, you know, like, you're, you're, just, you're just sort of 
refute everything that I say with it's not that way, it can't be right, it's oh, yes, wrong. Because what you because what you're saying just doesn't stack up against the evidence. I'm sorry, Taz. I mean you're a nice guy, but the evidence it's, doesn't stick in, in your mind. In your mind, what you need to do, well look, you, what you need to do is you need to try to look at it through a biblical lens. And it doesn't and that's, fit. That's, that, that, that's, well, yeah, I don't know if you've tried. What have you tried? Yes, I have tried, and it doesn't fit. It doesn't so make why sense. Did, why didn't it fit? Because you've got multiple different environmental facies which are just inconsistent with a massive flood. Uh, well, you're not looking at those facies from a biblical lens. You've All got, right. You've, how, how would you explain dry canters then? In the middle of the uh, the lower, uh, sorry, the upper Jurassic and lower Cretaceous. How would I describe what? Dry canters. They're, well, that, they're, uh, they're, they're windblown um, faceted stones, which develop over thousands of years in desert conditions when you've got wind blowing consistently in, in two opposing look at that. There'd be a, there'd be a watery explanation. I mean, no, there, is no watery, there is no watery explanation. This is, anyway, a, well, this is a strictly, this is a classic Aeolian sub aerial weathering phenomenon. It, it, it is not consistent with a flood. Okay. Well, that's fine. I'm not going to, I don't really want to get into an argument. And you're very good at just saying those sorts of things and I, I'm not, if you're in, in if you're interested in in understanding some sort of a way of looking at it I'll explain it but if you just everything I put up you just say no no it can't be right that's real that's nonsense I'm am sorry I, am I Taz, Steve, can I can I change tact here oh sorry go on Peter I was just to say my impression was um Taz that what you presented was um not actually a lot of evidence it was very big picture stuff and I think the problem is with the often with the detail, because you gave very little detail, which is a very safe position, I think, to present, but it does raise lots of questions. And then of course, you know, it's impossible to kind of raise that. But like when you gave that broad picture of the um, Great Artesian Basin, and then you sort of implied that it was sandstone. And I'm thinking, oh yes, we've got, and it was you know, several kilometers deep or a couple of kilometers deep. I'm thinking, and basically interpret that in terms of the flood. So open-minded, I think, okay, huge volume of sand must have been deposited because you said this was at the time the waters were rising. That's the best explanation for it. And then you talked about dinosaur footprints in that in that um, artesian basin sediment. And I'm thinking, okay, my first question I have is like, well, whereabouts in that sequence are the footprints? Because uh, if the dinosaurs are walking around, you've got that huge several kilometers of sand being dumped somewhere. Um, then that's going to wipe out any dinosaurs for sure. So where exactly were they? If they're not on the bottom, there's funny things going on here. Like how could dinosaurs cope with two kilometers deposition of sand and then walk on the top of it? So do you know whereabouts in that sequence the dinosaur footprints are? So again, it's lack of detail in what you're presenting, just a very broad picture stuff, but the, often the devil is in the detail. That's right. It's the we same specialize the, on the devil. So do you know where the, what, at what level the dinosaur footprints are? Do you know yeah, that? Definitely, I do know that. There's articles on creation.com about that, several of them. But the thing is... <laughs> no, but do you know off the top of your head? Can you answer it now? It's let a simple thing. Is it near Just the top or near the that. bottom? Is it near the top or the but, bottom? Well, they're right, obviously near the top. Right. They're obviously near the top because that's where they're discovered, near the top. But, um, so but how the do thing you explain is, that? How did they survive... All that deposition of two kilometers worth of sand. How did what dinosaur, survive? Dinosaurs. dinosaurs to walk on top of it. That means that sand must have been deposited before they got there. Yeah. So how did they walk okay. on top of that? How could they survive two kilometers deposition? There's an of article sand. on creation. That's, 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 that's immense. That's immense. And that's, have the, you heard that's the, the picture you presented. Sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> I'm sorry. Obviously, I didn't give you enough detail so that you can sort of figure it out. But have you heard of the beds hypothesis? No, I haven't. Bad hypothesis. That's one. That's one way of, it, like, there's a lot of articles on creation.com that talk about footprints which are found in sediments, and the fact that you find similar footprints at different levels, and so it's to do with the sediments being deposited and the 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 dinosaurs. Um, so similar dinosaurs are making the same footprints, um, you know, up through as the sediments were being deposited. Uh, 
but your cross section showed one to two kilometers of That's depositional true. sand. Mm. So that That's just doesn't true. fit. I can't like your 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 picture that you painted. I just can't conceive of it. It just doesn't. Okay, well, it just doesn't add up. I and well, you, I don't you present a very little detail that. because kind of you can get you know. So when you actually look at the detail, it just doesn't seem to work. Mm. Um, it's, okay. not just, it's not just the uh, Great Artesian Basin. I mean, there are many sedimentary basins around the world, which, according to the creationist model, must have been deposited during the uh, you know the high point of the flood and yet they have evaporites in you know uh, sediments uh, evaporated sediments uh, oh, which is, is just inconsistent with a global flood model you know, the, 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 okay, this, three things. this is just one of me so many different contradictions it just yeah. the, the, the literal reading just doesn't add up sorry Okay, well, I'm, I'm happy for you to get, go down that line. That's fine. So, I mean, Chance, if I could uh, go back to interject um, and um, hopefully not being too rude, um, you, you, <laughs> you, you actually sort of said, you know, why don't you ask me questions on geology? I think you're probably picking up there's only a couple of us that are actually capable of doing that. Um, uh, but there were some interesting things in the illustrations that you used. Uh, one of them was the start time, and um, and I've read a lot of the CMI stuff about um, uh, about distant starlight and how that's changing and stuff like that. And and um, uh, but but just to to go back, if we if we actually look at um, our general relativity and the fact that even the atheists got a hell of a shock, the atheists used to believe in an eternal Earth, right? And an eternal universe and somewhere around the 1950s or whatever when they expand uh, they found out the universe was actually expanding and einstein said whoops i goofed um then they had to actually uh admit that that actually if the universe was expanding then that means that it probably had a starting point you know in the beginning so i i, I thought your example of the stopwatch was a good one to show that if we have any confidence at all in the start time, using your analogy, then we should actually have some idea of the duration. So, so given that we have so much confidence within error bars of the start time, are you what? then faced with having assumptions on assumptions and just so stories about you've got to put just so stories with, with in one area and couple them with just so stories in another? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be um, wouldn't it be less risky for your faith, your kids, your grandkids, your neighbors to actually uh, consider that there might be other mysteries in Genesis and in our, our interpretations? It, it feels so, like a it feels like a, a problem that's caused and is growing. I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't follow your logic. Uh, okay, are. so so we we know a start time. Start time. What, the Einstein, start time is the big Bang is the Big Bang. What's the start yes, time you're talking? Yes, about? Yes, we know the start time because because we've actually got some measure of the of the um, uh, of the expansion rate of the universe, the Hubble constant, and we can but actually measure God some distance. How did God do it? You tell me. How did God do it? Oh, that I don't know. That I it really don't that. know. But but even did consider you know the ancient. What what did the what? what? Did, even consider the the ancients all right we've got uh, and here i'm gonna here i'm just gonna challenge you a little bit with the bible project and tim mackey and the and those guys right when and a little bit uh, with um uh, you know with uh, john walton um you know the concept of nothing how how does an ancient hebrew author actually even talk about or envisage nothing to 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 actually talk about disorder was a, a good idea, would make sense, right? So I guess I'm I'm just using your analogy to to challenge you back and go if we know the start time, which we do within good error bars because of Einstein, and remember a hundred years after he predicted and we measured gravitational waves, right? Um, then if we know the start time, doesn't that give you some confidence that if we know the start time? then we, we have to start working forward by your watch analogy. And here I'm referring to your watch analogy. Yeah, and um, 
See, I'm sorry, I still don't understand what you mean by start time. You're talking about the Big Bang. The, 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 yes, the we know the age of the universe because... But that's not, because... Einstein, that's um, not Einstein, that's Hubble, surely. No, Hubble's no, the no, one no, that no. came it's, up it's, with the Hubble constant. Yes, yes, once we've got the Hubble constants, you used Einstein uh, equations, to, uh, theory of relativity, the general theory in 1915, right? And you walk, work back and to the great surprise of most of the atheist physicists and the and the 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 um and the logical positivists of the day, right? Um, they went, oh crap, there's a beginning. We don't want that because that'll give a lot of weight to the theologians. That's so true. They so, still don't like it. No, and they you're absolutely right. And we can talk multiverse and stuff like that. And and I've already made the point that we probably share more in common than we do. Um, uh, apart, but 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 your but your I'm watch analogy your very much. <laughs> but your watch analogy, surely, surely that the watch analogy is for radioactive dating. It was not. That's what I used it for. So try to help you to understand that every radioactive date that you see is based on assumptions. That's all. Yeah, but, and, you, uh, yeah, but, but therefore, if we have a start time. Let thirteen point seven billion years ago, right? By your very analogy, that's got to cast doubt over the fact of the analogy that you're using. That's got to cast doubt on your conclusions or your interpretation. Oh, why don't we take twenty six billion dollars, uh, twenty six billion dollar a year? Because the cosmic background radiation exactly the same. Twenty six. Which you look in one direction, you look in the other. Cosmic background radiation is all the same. So there must have been some sort of mixing not, that no, transmitted no, 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 not, across twenty six billion years. No, not quite. It's not quite the same in, in every direction, actually. And that, that's like why that they're measuring that. But that but that's a, yeah. a but that's a an aside. The, here was the point in the 1950s, 60s, yes. they yes. got to the point where they went, oh crap, there's a star. Yes. So yeah, how I, if the yeah. universe didn't if the universe didn't like again, in reference to your watch analogy, surely that you see that if we if we've got a start time. That adds yeah. weight to actually knowing what that interval was. That, that's my simple point. Yeah. Well, Using for the first, first few, I don't know, the microseconds or seconds, the uh, the Big Bang was going faster than the speed of light. It had to in order so that it didn't collapse back on itself. It went at a huge speed to start off with. Day four described as we say, well, it might not have taken two or three seconds. It might have taken a full 24 hours, but you get the same effect. So what's the difference between the Big Bang expanding it faster than the speed of light for the first few seconds versus doing it in 24 hours in day four. You can explain the expansion of the universe. Well, no, look, well, we're was... getting off the track here. We were on geology. We, I, I want to go back. We, we were, we, we were on geology. Is, That's where we're at. No, no, no. The, the question was simply about if we know the start time, right, then yeah. that, that adds weight. Surely that adds weight to the fact that we can know the duration using using Taz's uh, illustration. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Look, fully agree, but we did get on to, I guess, cosmology um, as the illustration there or as an example. But look, enough said. Um, I think we'd better go back. Are there any, and I, look, I take your point, Tom, and I really appreciate your input tonight, but because we're now coming up to six minutes past nine, <laughs> are there any other comments that perhaps we've not really touched on so far? Um, yes, um, I'd like uh, on the radio. There's around about um, at least seven different uh, radioactive dating methods for measuring the age of the oldest rocks, and they all seem to converge on the 4.5 billion years. To me, in addition to which, there are several uh, astronomical ways of measuring the age of the uh, yeah. as well, uh, and you know they all converge as you say. Yeah, so that in itself looks compelling. And also when um, Gordon gave his um, slides, um, the, the ones that um, Steve was referring to, um, uh, they show that um, where you have isotopes that have a half-life, uh, which is much less than the 4.5 billion years, they're all gone. The only ones that we um, have are those with a higher half-life comparable with the 4.5 billion years that are still in existence. So mm -hmm. that's another kind of compelling view 
that the, the radio, radioactive method seemed to be fairly consistent in pointing to an old age. Uh, if I was going to criticize, I could imagine that if I said something here, you'd all jump on me. So <laughs> I sort of. Oh, I yes, yeah, that might be well correct. Yeah. You say you would actually address this when you were speaking earlier. You said you would leave that to the end. So you did say Which, you would address this. Earlier address the what? Book. A new well, class. The point what? that Kevin's just made about um, the lack of um, remaining isotopes. You mentioned. Oh, yes. Before. Okay. Well, the, the thing is, um, uh, the question is, where, where did these isotopes come from? How did they get there? So did, how did God create them? See, there's a, a whole scenario within the... Uh, I don't know what you call it to make it to make to make it sense. You call it evolutionary, the long age scenario. There's a whole there's a whole a, a lot of um, uh, stuff that's invented to make it work, you know. And so, how do you know how much of these uh, short age isotopes were created at the beginning if God created them? The the it's, long ages well, assume you can look at uh, current uh, supernova eruptions. You can look at the spectrum and you can yeah. see. That there's the complete range of radioisotopes in there. Uh, and exactly that, and right. That, and we know that the Earth has got, uh, and the whole solar system is made from stuff through several cycles of nuclear synthesis. So Where were you standing when that eminently, happened? Eminently, it's an eminently reasonable deduction that uh, all of those isotopes did exist. Uh, early on in the scene, and they've been decaying ever since. And it makes it makes such a clear cut, absolutely clear cut um, case when you look at hundreds of different isotopes. Many of them radio radio. Looking for a different a different story from what uh, is it? Uh, I don't know. Intel is it your name? Intel. Yeah, anyway, you're looking for a different. You I'm, asked me. I'm, a I'm Gordon. Yeah, if you ask me, you ask me a question, and if you'd like to see an explanation, go to creation.com and look up an article to do with a Christian a Christian view on radioactive dating. And in that in that response, there it was to uh, Roger Weens. Uh, there's a response there talking about short age isotopes. So, uh, but I mean, there's a whole scenario within the the uh, naturalistic worldview. See, the, the Bible is a supernaturalistic view. Is, would you agree with that? God created. He spoke and it was so. And mm -hmm. it says in, in, um, in Hebrews, it talks about that. You know, in Hebrews 11, it talks about that. So, but uh, the, the uh, people are looking for a, a naturalistic way of, of explaining things. No supernatural, nothing supernatural. So you've got to come up with something uh, else. Uh, well, no, no. Um... We're not, I'm certainly not saying that there's no supernatural. Of course there's supernatural. But so what did God do? What did God do in your scenario? What did he do? God did create, um, but the Bible doesn't go into details of how he did it. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a kind of shorthand in, the, in those early first few chapters of Genesis. We, we, we're not so, told because that's not what the Bible is about. Well, sorry, I, I must butt in here. We all talk about Genesis, but right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, arguably the most important part of the Old Testament, perhaps prior to Abraham, we have the uh, we're to take six days because God created the world in six days, and therefore we take the seventh day as a day of rest. So forget all about Genesis. Certainly Moses knew all about it and repeated it in those ten great commandments that have governed, I guess, the epitome of the uh, of the Jewish faith. You can look at all That's those good. biblical so you're references going to give, and you can, look at them, you can look at them from a literalistic view oh, and you can look at them from a metaphor, uh, metaphorical view. And they both, uh, you can read it both ways. Yeah, well, um, I was presenting a literal view. I was explaining a literal view. And so you're explaining a metaphorical view. So I think, and that's fine. I'm happy for that. And uh, maybe you could do the talk next time and talk about the metaphorical view and how that deals with the, the goodness of God and how he made a good world and where death came from and all that sort of thing and why Jesus died to fix up what God did wrong. Just a simple question of evidence. Yes. Why, why has, did you refer to carbon dating for dating diamonds as being 
not millions of years old when, I mean, I was taught at uni that carbon dating is only because of the half-life of carbon-14, only reliable up to 50,000 years. It's an scientific experiment. It's based, it's a, 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 an experiment which has been devised to test a hypothesis, that's sure. why. Yeah, but the implication that you were presenting is that this was actual evidence that supports the fact they're not million years old, whereas in actual fact, the evidence just um, isn't meaningful because it's outside the, the scope that's dictated by the half-life of carbon-14. So it's very misleading evidence to be presenting. No, it's not misleading. No, it's not misleading. It is misleading. It's a test. Are these, you know, if, no, it's if not a the valid world... Test. It's, like, it's like me... Hey, um, listen, yeah. let me finish, please. Sure? Let me finish. Okay. Sorry, test. sorry. It's a test. So the, 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 uh, the, the, the claim is that these diamonds are a billion years old. Hmm. That's the claim. And so one test of that is this, if they're a billion years old, diamonds are carbon, then if we, if we tested for carbon-14, we would expect to find none. No, 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 that's not, no, I've got, to, I've got to interrupt there. That's not the case. We would expect to find, if there is uh, diamonds anywhere near the surface, anywhere within the range of uh, cosmic rays, or anywhere in the surface or in the kimberlite from which they were found, any kind of natural background radiation, then there would be very small traces of radiocarbon. That's, that's just part of the error bounds of, of, the, uh, of the method. That's got nothing to do with the age, with the carbon age of the diamonds. It's just That's a method of looking at the yes. error bounds. And in any case, the diamonds are not dated by radiocarbon. They're dated by a whole range of other things appropriate to kimberlites of between uh, 0.6 I and I didn't about say they were percent. dated by radiocarbon. Or maybe it didn't explain that uh, carefully. Well, the, the diamonds don't prove anything. Uh, the, the, they have a very small background radiation, uh, 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 radiocarbon derived from radiation which any where's the radiation oh, come from you're just making this up I no think, i'm not right no you can go to any kimberlite you like and you will find traces of uranium and thorium in uh, in various uh, mineral minerals small small amounts of those radioactive uh, minerals you can look at that uh, kimberlites in africa or australia or siberia or anywhere you like and you will find background traces of radiation which give rise to small amounts of radiocarbon. That's got nothing to do with the age of the diamonds. Nothing. Okay, you said it. <laughs> well, look, I, I thank you for everyone. Yeah. I, I think we're going to have to agree to disagree. And look, I do thank you for the tone of yeah. this presentation. I must say, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed, enjoyed my time. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Not we obviously <laughs> have, yeah, well, we, we've obviously, realize there is this deep division between old age and young age mm, right. views. Uh, I don't think we can say that. I want to thank you though, Taz, for putting up a model. Yes, I um, know it was not necessarily accepted by many of the way here. It's not accepted because, uh, because but you, you did put up that model thing. and yeah. uh, showed the contrast between, if you like, the $4.6 billion column and then the, the flood, um, the, sorry, the pre-flood, the post of uh, the flood and then the post flood world uh, in a model that was presented from, I guess, a, a literal um, understanding of uh, the young earth creationists. I think if nothing else, that presentation of that model is out there now. And as you said, it's already available through Michael Ord and others. Um, so look, I think that's where we may wind it up tonight. It was one of the more robust uh, debates we've had. <laughs> over the course of the year, but uh, it was done with more politeness, perhaps, than some of the others that have preceded it. <laughs> Kevin, would you like to say uh, anything uh, as the um, director of our uh, Reasonable Faith? Uh, just a comment on you enjoying it. Are you a masochist? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, my aim was to throw up some ideas, big picture things, so that some of you would go away and say, that's interesting, I'm going to explore that further. Yeah, that's yeah. what my aim was and i don't think i've achieved i don't think i've achieved my aim <laughs> so, but I, I wish you all the best i've heard your views and that's really good yeah, and I, it's been mm. good to hear them but yeah, i did think that there would be at least people would say okay that's interesting that's interesting features i i'll, I'll look into this so there you go
Mm. Well, touch base with Ron Neller, if you would. I don't think he had as many old ages uh, on his show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, had, so you... I, I'm afraid I'm afraid a couple of your uh, supporters were not able to make it, so um, it was yeah. a more difficult situation. But, um, yeah, thank you very much for being willing to uh, yeah. come on. And, and, and uh, up, yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. Uh, and, anyway, I, I've been in a, a uh, lion's den before. <laughs> and... Uh, but I am amongst atheists, but it's, nothing has been quite as strong as this one, I must admit. I'm sorry. <laughs> and and is, isn't that interesting? Because I think, we, aren't we all, I think this call tonight, we all would regard ourselves as brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes. Well, yeah. At least yeah. I, yeah. I, I think you... Yeah. I, I didn't, God, I God didn't is say, I, I didn't make any accusations about, you know, uh, trying to put anything on any of you, but I must admit it was an interesting time. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, anyway, thank you very much for making a con contribution and we appreciate your presentation. Good on you. And I've yeah. appreciated the opportunity and I think it's good that you're having this discussion. And uh, anyway, do a bit. that's good. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, well, um, uh, we, would you like to finish the recording now then, uh, please? Um, uh, thanks, Kevin. Yep, I'll do that now.